And we saw how the servants went to the mother of Jesus, Mother Mary, and asked her to press her maternal influence on Jesus. And we saw how Jesus, looking down that tunnel of time, and seeing all the crimes of the Catholic Church over the, over the wrong, idolatrous exaltation of Mary, and he wanted to make it very clear that she had no influence over him as his mother, as we saw that Jesus never called Mary mother, but only woman. And that was shocking when people heard him say that. I was at my, my son's house last Friday night, and I was saying that, um, that Jesus never called Mary his mother. And my youngest grandson, Colton, who's very attached to his mother, <laughs> Um, who has no, been known to sit on the couch and kiss her arm, oh. tell her that he loves her, immediately shot up and said, why not? <laughs> he was shocked that he did not be called Mother Anna. So uh, it was shocking for Colton, it was shocking for them to hear Jesus say to, to, to his mother, woman. And, and, and then he, he, he said, woman, what have I to do with you? And, and, and we, what he was saying there is that there's no special relationship. Let me make this very clear, in other words, he was saying. Let me make this very clear. There is no special relationship between me, me and Mary than there is between anyone else who are his followers that he called my mother. In Matthew chapter 12, 48, Matthew chapter 12, 4, 48, he said, he said, who is my mother? And then in, in, in the same <clears throat> Matthew 12, 50, whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, he said the same as my mother. So um, we saw how God put this history in the Bible to help Catholic people specifically to Revelation 18, 4, Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. And then Jesus said something to Mary that showed where his mind was, where he was thinking when he said to her in uh, verse 4, verse 4, my hour is not yet come. Oh, wait a minute. She's talking about there's no wine at the, at the wedding, that they ran out of wine. But he says something which is very disconnected Mine hours not yet come. Jesus has just been told that there's no wine for the people, and Jesus responds by saying that his hour was not yet come. Now that means that his hour was going to come. It was coming. He said, not yet come. It's coming. It's on the way. And that was the hour he spoke of, for example, in Mark 14, 41, Mark 14, 41, when he said, uh, he, he said he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, and it says, he came to his disciples a third time, and he said to them, they were sleeping, he, they said, uh, he said, sleep on now, take your rest, it's enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. The hour that was coming was when he would be betrayed into the hands of sinners. He also said in John 12, 23, a verse that we've been talking about this morning in the Breaking of Bread, John 12, 23, Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So the hour that came was when he was betrayed. The hour that came was when he would be glorified. And then when he be, in, in his high priestly prayer, when he spoke to the Father, his, 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 uh, his preparation, his talk with the coach before he went onto the football field in the locker room, John 17, John 17, he said, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eye to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Again, he's a football player. He's in the, he's in the, he's in the, the locker room. And he's saying, he's saying to the coach, I'm ready. The coach is saying to him, Are you ready to go out on the field? And he's saying, I'm ready. And he, this is what's happening in John 17. John 17, and he, he says, the hour has come. I'm ready to go out onto that field 
where I will be betrayed, where I will, my body will be broken, where my, 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 I will bleed to death on a cross. I'm ready. That's the field of conquest that he went out on. And he said, the hour has come. He was talking about that. That hour that he spoke of was the time when he would die as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. That was an hour that he lived for. That was an hour that he always kept in front of him. That was a, an hour that, that there wasn't a day that went by that he didn't say the words that John the Baptist said to announce him in John 1, 129. John 129, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Every day he got up in the morning, he said to himself, I am the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. When he taught the people, he thought, he thought to himself, I must prepare the people. I must tell the people what real sin is. Real sin is not eating a cheeseburger. Real sin is not eating milk and, 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 and meat together. Real sin are evil thoughts, bad thoughts, and actions too. I must explain that, he thought to himself, to the people so that they know they all need me to be for them the Lamb of God, to take away their sins. With every temptation that Jesus faced in life, Jesus said to himself, I'm the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world, and the Lamb of God must be without blemish and sinless. And if I yield to this temptation right now, I will let down the world who needs me to be the sinless Lamb of God to take away their sin. If I yield to the sin, I will let down God the Father, who called me and sent me to be the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Every moment of every day, Jesus was thinking, I am the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And as the Lamb of a family, back in, in Exodus days, took away the judgment of the death of the firstborn in Egypt on Passover night by the blood of the lamb of the family posted on the door as an announcement to all, especially to God, that they had put their faith and trust in this in, in God's word, which said, When I see the blood, I will I will pass over you. So Jesus would take away the sin of the world by his blood, and the symbol for his blood with wine, with wine. When he said at the last dinner, before he did give his blood to be poured out as an offering for sin, it was at that dinner that he said, Matthew 26, 27, Matthew 26, 27, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's when Jesus held out that cup of deep red wine and said that the wine was the representation of his blood. And just as the alcohol in the, blood, in the, in the wine kills infecting microbes, Boy, am I glad for that. When I was in England, they used the same cup and they pass it around to everybody. And I thought, sure, I'm glad that's alcoholic wine and not grape juice. <laughs> everybody, anyway. Just as the alcohol in the wine kills the infecting microbes that could kill a person, so the blood of Christ kills the infecting sins that can kill a person into a state of eternal suffering and hell. And Jesus held out that wine and explained how it symbolized his blood. And then he offered it. He, he, he said, drink of this, drink of this. Don't just, don't just listen to me, Jesus said. Don't just watch me, Jesus said. Don't just get this, this lesson that this red wine is symbolizing my blood. He said, drink of it. And that was momentous when he made that invitation for everyone with command to drink the same cup of wine. And when Jesus did that, he was saying that 
as the blood of the Passover lamb had to be posted on the door of the house, so the blood of Jesus had to be on the heart of every person who wanted to experience personally Jesus as their Lamb of God who would take away their sins. And just as there was not a moment when Jesus was not thinking that he was the Lamb of God whose blood would take away the sin of the world, so there was not a moment when Jesus was, was not thinking of wine as a speaking voice about his blood that would take away the sin of the world. So when Mary said to Jesus in verse 3 that the people had no wine, Jesus responded to Mary by saying in verse 4, my hour is not yet come. And what was going on in the mind of Jesus was Jesus was thinking constantly about why symbolized his blood that would take away the sin. So when Mary told Jesus, the people have, the people have no wine, Jesus heard Mary say, the people have none of your blood to take away their sin. And so when Jesus responds in verse 4 with, my hour is not yet come, that was Jesus saying, I know the people don't have my blood yet to take away their sin, but they will, just not yet. Because as the Lamb of God in my blood is poured out of me to take away their sin, that will be my hour. Right now, my hour is not yet come. Now, that answer that Jesus gave to Mary clearly showed that Mary and Jesus were not on the same wavelength. They, 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 they were not communicating because Mary and Jesus were on different frequencies. Mary and Jesus were on different channels. And, and, and Mary was on the wedding channel when, 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 when she said, they had no wine for the wedding. But, and, but Jesus was on the Lamb of God channel when he replied that his hour was not yet come for the sins of, uh, sins of man to be taken away by his blood. Not yet. And those two channels were as far as north from south from each other. And so, there was a question on the table. Was Mary going to get on Jesus' channel? Or was Jesus going to get on Mary's channel? And that happens in our lives. That happens in our life. We come to God prayerfully, reading our Bible. We talk to Jesus about a certain problem, and Jesus talks to us about a totally different issue as he's speaking to us from the Bible. We have to ask ourselves a question. Are we going to get on Jesus' channel? Or are we going to insist that Jesus get on our channel? It reminds me of when, our, when my youngest son, Josh, had a baby, his baby. He had a baby. And his baby was, I was over visiting, his baby was babbling on. Just babble, baby babble on. And I asked Josh about, well, what's he saying? And Josh says to me, well, the question is, are we going to learn his language or are you going to learn our language? <laughs> Mary did the best she could when, when she turned to the servants and said, verse 5, whatever he says to you to do, just do it. That was Mary's finest hour when she told the servants that they were to no longer look at her for their needs, for the interpretation of what in the world he just said, or what, what they should do. And Mary in verse 5 just told the servants, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Stop looking at me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That was Mary speaking to the Catholic Church when she said, don't look at me. Just turn your eyes on Jesus and listen to him and do what he tells you to do. Now, what Jesus told them to do was to fill the pots with water. All those pots that were there by the calculation of the number and the quantities, over 100 gallons of, of, of water there. No, and he turned it into wine. That was a lot of wine. That was, in our day, the equivalent to 500 bottles of wine. A lot of wine, <laughs> as we know it. And that was a huge provision of wine. And God said in Psalm 81.10, Psalm 81.10, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, 
open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. <laughs> he said. As the hymn said, feed me till I want no more. Oh, thou great Jehovah. And it, it, you know, it's, it, it, we, we read this passage, it's so easy for us. Oh, yes, Jesus turned water into wine. But it's like, no, wait, stop. You know, Johnny Cash, Johnny Cash had this song where, you know, he talked about, uh, he sang it at Folsom Prison, he talked about going into uh, Cana of Galilee to, to some church, you know, and there's a sister in the water. And he, and he, he, and he had this song, and, 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 and in the song, he just keeps saying in his typical nasal voice, he turned the water into wine. He just kept saying that in the song. And when he kept repeating that, that voice, you know, he turned the water into wine. There's like an undercurrent me message that comes through and that there's something more significant here to this event of he turned the water into wine. And there's something much more important than just what happened. He turned the water into wine. And what was stunning about all that was the simple truth in verse nine, verse nine, verse nine, the water that was made wine. There was water there at the wedding, lots of water, but there was no wine, and they needed wine. Water was there, but water wasn't enough. Wine was needed, and in that sense, water represents all we have in life: good things like family, like home, like work like food, like clothing, like friends. And those are, all those are things we have in life. It's like the water, abundance of water available at that wedding, as we have an abundance on earth. But the wine was not at the wedding. And there was something that we need that we don't have naturally in life. It's something, it's something that family, home, work, food, clothing, friends, cannot supply us with, and that's the presence and the friendship, the close friendship of Jesus. Like the hymn says, like he says, he turned the water into wine. Another stunning truth of he turned the water into wine is just from the word transformed, transformed. He turned the water into wine, which means he transformed the water into wine. Water was at the wedding, but it took Jesus to transform the water into wine. We're here today. We're a group of believers. But you could say we're like water believers. <laughs> but wine is like a group of believers who love each other. He turned the water into wine transforms a fellowship of believers into a fellowship of love. It transforms that. Water's like a marriage on earth. It's all passionate love. But wine is a marriage on earth where there is agape love, sacrificial love, representing the love of Christ for his people, for his church. He turned the water into wine when he transforms a marriage into a representation of Christ's sacrificial love for the church. Water's like trouble. Water's like trouble that we all face in life. Wine is a blessing, a blessing of separation from sin. He turns the water into wine when he transforms the trouble in our lives into a blessing where we call it quits with sin. As it says in 1 Peter 4.1, 1 Peter 4.1, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. He turned the water into wine. Water at the wedding was good. Good. There's nothing wrong with water. Wine's better. Wine's better. He turned the water into wine which means that Jesus takes what's good in our lives and makes it better. You know, the great prayer, the Jewish prayer over the blood, not over the bread, over the bread, you know, Baruch HaTad Anai, Habotzi Lechem, Min Haaretz, blessed is God who brings us 
bread, who brings forth bread from <coughs> dirt, brings forth bread from dirt. All right. That's an amazing statement that out of the dirt comes bread. Isaiah 55, 10, Isaiah 55, 10, for as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. I'll take that title. I like it. I like to be the eater. <laughs> God takes water and dirt and seed, and he brings forth bread to the eater. That's amazing. And in a similar way, God takes water and seed and dirt and he brings forth juice of the grape that becomes wine. That's the transformation. He turned the water into wine. Every day, the growing vine with its juice shows us the miracle of he turned the water into wine. The law came by Moses, and the law was a curse for us. Just as the first plague that Moses brought on Egypt was Exodus 7.19. Exodus 7.19, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying unto Aaron, Take thy rod, stretch it out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, that be the Nile, upon their streams, upon their rivers, upon their ponds, upon all their pools of water that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded. He lifted up the rod, smote the waters that were in the rivers in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. I don't know if you can get a full picture, if I can get a full picture, if we can get a full picture of that scene. Water lapping up on the shores of ponds, rivers, streams, and the Nile River, all of a sudden is now blood lapping up on the shores. Fish that were vibrant in all those places now rise to the surface dead and the land stinks from death. That was a curse that Moses turned the water into blood. And in the opposite of Moses, opposite of Moses, because grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by the opposite of Moses. Blessing, he turned the water into wine. Moses brought the curse by transforming the water into blood, but Jesus turned the water into wine when he turned the curse of Moses, transforming the blood water into blood, into a blessing when he transformed the water into wine. Deuteronomy 23, 5. Deuteronomy 23, 5. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. He turned the water into wine. And those servants... They just didn't sit back and do nothing and watch him turn the water into wine. He could have. He could have just miraculously caused those, those vessels there to fill up on their own with water. He brought water out of a stone. There's no problem with him bringing water into empty water vessels. And then he could turn the water into wine. But it didn't work that way. They had work to do. They had to fill those pots with water. That's the way that God operates with us. We first have our hands on what God wants us to do by faith. We put our hands on as those servants put their hands on those pots and fill them with water. We put our hands on what God wants us to do by faith. And then we, as God does the miracle... We turn our hands upward to praise God and thank Him and be grateful and worship and praise Jesus. As I'm sure those servants were, as they poured out that wine, were stunned. At least one out of ten, I would expect, would stop like the Samaritans. 
want that one Samaritan to say thank you. Because when he turned the water into wine, he used what was there, the water pots. And that's what God does in our lives. He uses what we have in order to do his miracles. And we can put ourselves, and we should, in the, in the, in the place of those servants when they discovered, I don't know what it was. I don't know was when, when they dipped into those water pots and they saw it was wine or when they, when they were pouring it out when they saw it was wine. I don't know when it was. But whatever it was, when they discovered that he had turned the water into wine, when they first discovered that they ran out of wine, they discovered that. And for that situation of, of running out of wine for those servants, they had two roads that could go down. The one road, the most common road, is the oh no road. The oh no road is the road of stress. It's the road where you get into, how could this have happened? You, you know, you, you throw that gear in place. How could this happen? Who was responsible for making sure that we had enough wine? Who drank more wine than he should have? <laughs> Who was responsible for the plan? How could this have happened? Now, what is going to happen now to the whole wedding? Because we ran out of wine. This happens to be a really great scene in the, in the Chosen about uh, uh, and, and, and And when we flip into that mode in life, prayer is the last thing on our mind. Anger has displaced prayer. And, and it's, that's the oh no road. It's a, it's a tragic road that leads to no rest. It leads to insomnia. It leads to being tired all the time. It leads to a, 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 a impairment of the immune system which results in cancer. Apart from that, it's fine. <laughs> the, the, the other road of the oh no road is when if, what if those servants, when they first discovered there was, not, there was no wine, if they said, oh, this is great. Because now we get to see what God will do working with this tragedy. And God says what to do in those tragic situations or any tragic situation. Jeremiah 33.3, Jeremiah 33.3. He says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God's command in Jeremiah 33.3 is simply call. That's all. Just call. Call, call it to me. And that word me in Jeremiah 33, 3, as in don't just call, but call it to me, makes it all very personal. As I told this Jewish uh, violinist last week, you know, if you ever find yourself in the kind of trouble where you're alone and where there's no one who can help you, don't just call to God. Because the title God is so impersonal, it's so nondescript. Everybody refers to God, and no one knows who you're talking about. A prayer to just God, as I told her, constitutes a letter that will be returned for insufficient address. I don't know who it is. God has a name. It's known by his name. That name crystallizes exactly who God is. And that name is Jesus Christ. That's God's name. And when a prayer is addressed to Jesus Christ as God, then the angelic postal person <laughs> looks at that letter and says, I know exactly who this is going to. Because that letter is supposed to reach God. And that's what the word me conveys in Jeremiah 33.3. 3. It means it's so personal it's Jehovah Jesus who's speaking in Jeremiah 3 when he says, call unto me. And that means call in the name of the Lord because Joel 2.32, Joel 2.32 says, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It reminds me of the time I got in this airplane and I sat down in my seat. Next to me was this big black man. He was scared. And I sat down next to him. And I said, uh, I, was, I was rushing to get into the plane. I was all out of breath. And I sat down. I said, praise the Lord. I just said that. And he was a towering man. And he leaned over me and he says, and he had that voice, and who might that Lord be? 
He's towering over me like a shadow. And I said, the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and he said, all right now. <laughs> Who might that Lord be? Never forget that. God has a name. He's known by that name. He's crystallized in, in representation when you say the name of Jesus Christ. When a prayer is addressed to Jesus Christ as God, that letter reaches who it's supposed to reach. That's the word me in Jeremiah 33.3. It means it's so personal as Jehovah Jesus speaking, call it to me. The name of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Joel 2.32 means whoever calls on the name of Jesus Christ shall be delivered. The second point about Jeremiah 33.3 is that Jehovah Jesus says that he will answer with great and mighty things. Jesus answers with great and mighty things because Jesus is great and mighty. Israel was backed up against the Red Sea thinking that their blood was going to now be the dye that stains the sand by the shore of the Red Sea. And there was not one of those Jewish people there who said, well, I know what God's going to do. He's just going to open up the Red Sea like a big zipper. And we're just going to walk through there on dry land. That's right. And if any Jewish person had said that, he would have been laughed at and told, get real. But that's exactly what God did. It's exactly what God did. God did at the Red Sea, Jeremiah 33, 3, great and mighty things which thou knowest not. It would have been so much better for those Jewish people to have had their confidence in the God, in God, who had just done ten miraculous plagues to get them released from Egypt. It would have been so much better if the thought just started to spread throughout the, 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 the group there piled up at the Red Sea. Well, God just went to a lot of trouble to get us free from Egypt. I don't think he brought us out here to dye the sand red with our blood. That would have been an oh God road instead of an oh no road. And when this wedding was over, that he turned the water into wine, the conclusion of it all is verse 11. Verse 11, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. When verse 11 says that Jesus turned the water into wine, that that, that was manifesting forth his glory, Glory means what Jesus was famous for. Glory means how Jesus showed that he was great and mighty because he did great and mighty things when he turned the water into wine. And we magnify the glory of God as, as in Psalm 34, 3, Psalm 34, 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We magnify the Lord when we meditate on and talk about the great and mighty things that Jesus, that Jehovah Jesus did. Like the great and mighty thing of, he turned the water into wine. Johnny Cash keeps repeating that phrase. He turned the water into wine. This is to say, keep thinking about that. And then the result of Jesus showing how great and mighty he was is verse 11, verse 11, where it says his disciples believed on him. Now the Greek word for on there, as is so often the case, on, in, it's translated. It's the word ice. And the Greek word ice means into. So a better translation for that last statement is, in verse 11, is his disciples believed into him. That means the disciples believed themselves, they believed themselves into Jesus. In other words, they wanted to be for their lives, Colossians 1 27, Colossians 1 and 27, Christ in you the hope of glory. They wanted to be for their lives, 1 Corinthians 1.30, 1 Corinthians 1.30, ye in Christ Jesus. They wanted to be in Christ Jesus and they wanted Christ Jesus to be in them. Because they saw he turned the water into wine. And they said, I want to be in Christ, I want him to be in me. They believed themselves into Christ. Believing into Christ means to no longer stand as a Observer, outsider, distant from, interested in, but with a barrier. 
but it means to become an inside participant in Jesus Christ. Listening intently to what Jesus Christ has to say in order to do diligently what Jesus Christ wants done. And after this first miracle, we read in, in uh, verse 12, it goes on, that after this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and disciples. They continued there not many days. He moves now, not a very long distance, from Cana to a city called Capernaum for a short visit. Now, Capernaum was a city that Jesus called his own city. Jesus didn't call Nazareth his own city. Everybody said that you know, Jesus is Nazareth, but he called his city Capernaum in Matthew 9, 11, 9, 1, Matthew 9, 1. He was raised in Nazareth, but he called his own city Capernaum. Why? It was like a central point. It was like his headquarters. It was like strategically located in, in, in Galilee so that he could move out to the different places around Galilee, but yet come back to Capernaum as a place of rest after, it was a, after a tough time of teaching or doing miracles. So he, now he goes for a brief visit to Capernaum, and he's accompanied by, there's a group here that's described. It's an interesting group that's described. That Mary is described, his brothers are described, and his disciples are described. They're all following him. Wouldn't you like to have been there? I would have. To have been there and to, to walk with him as he's going, listen to what he's saying as he's walking. Wouldn't you like to, to, to have been in that group when he sat down to eat wherever he was eating and, and, and listen to his assessments of the day? He was very talkative, Jesus was. Would you like to have been there at the, the end of the day and, and sit around and, 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 and hear him pour out his heart over the day, over tomorrow? But not everyone was really interested in what Jesus had to say in that group. Mary was. Mary was. His <coughs> disciples were. But Mary's children were not really interested. Why? Because of John 7, 5. John 7, 5. Neither did his brethren believe into him. It's an interesting group. There were those, his brothers, that were following him. They could care less about what he had to say. They weren't interested. They were interested in what he did, what he, potentially the impact on them. John 6, 26, John 6, 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you needed of the loaves and were filled. Jesus made the children of Mary famous because people said, oh, you are the brothers of Jesus, the miracle worker. And that was interesting for them. But Mary was following, and she had come to understand in her life that Jesus would pay her no more respect than any other person. But Mary followed Jesus because Mary wanted to learn from Jesus. Not to intercede for others to Jesus, but she was a learner. She was, she was a hider. She was hiding things in her heart. She was a keeper. She was keeping the sayings of Jesus inside of her, mulling on them, trying to figure out what did they mean, trying to piece it together with what he said before. That's Mary. It was a mixed group that were following Jesus, just like in churches. It's a mixed group. The committed to Christ, they're in church. The curious about Christ, God alone knows the hearts. Anyway, we're told he didn't spend much time in Capernaum. And that was because always in his mind, he was thinking, the next person, the next person. There were many people that needed Christ. They were in many places. And Christ only used his rest just to get recharged and then to move on to those different places to encounter those different people. This was his burning passion. Reach the lost, reach the lost. As he said in John 9, 4, John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. He saw the night coming when he would not be able to work anymore. And that drove him. That drove him. Now, now we have in verse 13, the most important feast for, 
for Jesus wasn't Yom Kippur, it was Passover. Because he knew he was the Passover Lamb of God. And so he wanted to be in Jerusalem, as the Bible said to do, all the males should go to Jerusalem during certain feasts, and Passover was one of them. And so in verse 13, verse 13, we read, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, when we read verse 13, there's one very surprising word that seems almost out of place to describe the Passover. It's the word Jews, as in possession. possession. That word's surprising, because Passover was first described in Exodus 12. Exodus 12, 11, when it says, Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in the Lord's haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Now, it was strange in verse 13 that this Passover was called the Jews' Passover. That's strange. Everybody's Jewish. Why say that? It's like when I was, when I was raised in Los Angeles, which was a Jewish ghetto. When I was raised in Los Angeles, and, and if, you, if anybody ever said among my friends, are you Jewish, they would look at you puzzled, like, of course. Everybody was Jews. Everybody was Jews. Oh, all was Jews. Everyone there was Jewish. So why would you call it the Jews' Passover? How did we go from Exodus 12, 11 of the Lord's Passover to John 2, 13, the Jews' Passover? That's a very similar question to James 1.27. James 1.27, which says, pure religion and undefiled, not, not spoiled, before God and the Father is this, visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. That's pure religion. But... In Galatians 1.13, Galatians 1.13, we have, you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. How did we go from James 1.27, pure religion, of visiting the widows and keeping yourself clean, to Galatians 1.13, the Jews' religion of persecuting the church and wasting it. How'd that happen? How did pure religion get changed to the Jews' religion? God's religion got changed by man into an ever-growing set of man's rules. Do this. Don't eat a cheeseburger. That's how religion got corrupted. Man's religion is all about do. You have to do all these sacraments in the Catholic Church and works in order to get to heaven. God's religion is all about done. You have to trust in what Christ did as the Lamb of God when he died for your sins to take away those sins in order so you can go to heaven. And in the same way, the pure Passover of God, expressed as the Lord's Passover in Exodus 12, is now changed in verse 13 to the Jews' Passover. And the truth is that the Passover today, celebrated by the Jews, has been so changed, it doesn't even look like the Lord's Passover. And that's for one reason. And that one reason is the, re, re, is the reverberating question that Isaac asked his father Abraham on the way up to Mount Moriah in Genesis 22.7. Genesis 22.7, Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb? For the burnt offering. Today the Jews' Passover has become what's called a Seder. The word Seder means order, which emphasizes the order of it all. There must be orderly preparations, place settings. You have to follow this program, the Haggadah. But the most important star of the show, of the Passover, is missing the lamb. Isaac's question reverberates in every Jewish Passover. Where is the lamb? There can be no Passover without the lamb. Today, the only reference to a lamb, the typical Jewish Seder Passover, is a dried up lamb shank bone placed on the Seder table. There's no blood to save from sin. Only an orderly 
Seder. Here's the wood. Here's the fire. I see the knife. Father Abraham, where's the lamb? There's not a trust in the done of the death of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Whenever I go to Jewish Passover and I look at that dried up lamb shank on the table, I think to myself, Ezekiel 37 11, Ezekiel 37 11, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. That dried up lamb shank, shank there reminds me of Ezekiel 37 11. Our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. Hope is lost. Without Jesus Christ as Lamb of God, there's no hope. Because Jeremiah 14, 8, Jeremiah 14, 8. Oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof in the time of trouble. That's not New Testament. That's Jeremiah 14, 8. Jeremiah 17, 13. Not New Testament. This is Jeremiah 17, 13. O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. There's only one hope of Israel, and it's Jesus Christ. He alone is the hope of Israel, and a hope without Jesus Christ is like a dried up land <coughs> of hope. hope is lost, which is right, which is why right now, as you know. We are distributing two million copies of the book changed into Israel that every Jewish home in Israel should receive one. And so far to date, thank God, we've accomplished 600,000 Jewish homes in Israel. Already, the TV channel 15 in Israel has devoted 10 minutes, or nine minutes, or a little more than nine minutes, of airtime with a panel of five persons arguing, discussing our book distribution. I'm going to write them a thank you note for the free every time. <laughs> Their whole emphasis, there needs to be a law in Israel to not prevent this. You know, on that program, there is the representation of the anti-missionary group called the Hand of the Brothers, Yad Lachim. And he said on the program, we have a lot of trouble every year with this Tom Cantor. For 12 years, we've had the summer blitz. Millions of Jewish stores knocked on U.S., Mexico, Israel. For 12 years, we've had the every Saturday L.A. outreach through the school year. As we continue to go, we go to the same doors. Yes. And people have asked us, why do you go? You've already been there. Why do you go? Why? Because now there is no interest in the books, and they're thrown in the trash. But we know a year's coming when there will be a diagnosis of cancer with only months to live, and then that book will not be thrown in the trash, and it will be Isaiah 34, 16, Isaiah 34, 16, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Now, Jesus first goes into the temple in Jerusalem at the time of Passover, and he makes a discovery in verse 14, verse 14, he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of the money sitting. That was how the Passover was changed from the Lord's Passover into the Jews' Passover by using the temple as a place to make money, by selling animals to be sacrificed and by ex doing the exchange of common money into temple money. And when he walked in the temple of God and he saw that side of the many, the many changers, he, 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 he was the one sent by God the Father. He was the was the last, he was the subject of the last book, second to last chapter in the Old Testament of Malachi 3.1, Malachi 3.1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi 3.1 says that suddenly he appears in the temple, and suddenly Jesus is there in the temple. And Malachi goes to state on and then what the Lord would do when he comes to his temple, which is Malachi 3.2, Malachi 3.2. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appears? He's like a refining fire, like a polar soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as silver and gold. 
they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. So what are we told there in Malachi 3? That when, when God comes to his temple, he's going to purify it. He's going to cleanse it. And this is what he did. This is what he then did in verses 15 to 16. He finds some, some cords maybe that's, that were thrown on the ground uh, uh, for leading the animals, some ropes. He, he, he ties them together. And, and he, he uses that like whips and he drives out all the people. He drives out the animals out of there. And he says, this is my father's house. Don't make it a house of business. Just like what Jacob says, I'm going to go follow God in, in Genesis 35. Genesis 35, 1. And when God said to him, go and make an altar to me at Bethel. And, 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 and then in the, in the next verse, Genesis 35, 2, Genesis 35, 2, Jacob said unto his household and all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean. He said, and then he went up there and made the altar. That's Jesus. He's saying, get rid of these things. You know, because, because Jacob knew there can be no worship. There can be no serving God until there's a cleansing. In the same way, we can't worship God. We can't serve God until we're cleansed. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Who is behind all this money changing? Who's behind it? The, who's behind all that business there? The priests. The priests. They were behind this business of selling the animals for sacrifice. No doubt the priest certified the animals as up. This one's without blemish. What a price he will bring. Just like the rabbis make money today, certifying food products as kosher. Do you realize that the kosher food industry in this country is a 22 billion dollar industry billion what did he do in verse 15 verse 15 he drove them all out of the temple he drove the money changers out he drove the animals out he drove the animal sellers out we never read of it, of jesus then driving anyone into the temple what we read here of him driving him out of the temple and he pours out the money changers money it shows the contempt that Jesus had over religion that makes money. And he says, don't do this. Don't take my father's house and make it a house of business. The disciples are shocked. They're seeing this and they're trying to process it. They're thinking about it. And they're honing in on those words. He called this his father's house. He called it his father's house. They're thinking back to Samuel. When Samuel was talking to King David, and he, and he said to him, you know, you're not going to build a temple, but your son's going to build a temple in, in uh, 2 Samuel 7, 2 Samuel 7, 5. Thus saith the Lord, shall thou build me a house for me to dwell in? And second same chapter, 2 Samuel 7, 7, 12, 7, 12, says he's going to have a seed. David is going to build a temple, establish his throne. That had an immediate fulfillment in, in Solomon, yes, but it had a future fulfillment also in the Messiah, when he would build his temple. Jesus said, I will build my church, I will build my temple, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What was that? That's 1 Corinthians 3.16. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And when they saw all this, this explosion that Jesus had, the disciples thought, Psalm 69.9, Psalm 69.9, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. And the, and the disciples said, zeal? They saw energy that exploded. That's the same energy, the same zeal. Christ had that zeal to get rid of that business and merchandise out of the temple of God. That's the same zeal that exploded to him in. And when he said, I'm going to get rid of the sin that's keeping people out of, out, of, out of heaven, I will be the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for sharing your Son with us. In Jesus' name, amen.